Good afternoon and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Brisbane South PHN's first virtual annual general meeting. Uh, my name is Cindy Shannon and I'm a proud descendant of the Noogie people uh, from Kwandamooka country. I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the Kwandamooka peoples, Yagara, Yugambe speaking peoples and the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work and the many different nations across the wider Brisbane South region. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging as the holders of the memories, the traditions, the culture and the spiritual well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the nation. We acknowledge any sorry business that may be affecting the communities. In the spirit of reconciliation, partnership and mutual respect, we will continue to work together with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to shape a health system which responds to the needs and aspirations of the community. I'd like to welcome honourable members of parliament, members of the board, member organisations, community organisations, health system partners, clinical and advisory council members, our staff and members of the communities we work to serve. A warm welcome also to Beck Fulbrook, our lived experience advisor on domestic and family violence, Senator the Honourable Anne Rushton, Minister for Families and Social Services, Ms Terry Butler, MP, Member for Griffith, and Dr Deepa Balakrishnan, we look forward to your insights this afternoon. Uh, we'll do our best to keep this session to an hour, and you'll see that there's a box on the screen next to the feed that will allow you to ask questions, which will be monitored throughout the AGM and uh, answered at the end. Our thanks for accommodating this most unusual format of meetings in what has been a most unusual year. So I'd like to begin uh, by giving you a brief report from myself. Um, you'll be hearing from our CEO, Mike Bosel, very shortly, but um, this year has been one of extraordinary achievement, challenge and opportunity. And uh, Mike will outline a very ambitious uh, change and innovation agenda that we've embarked upon. So in my remarks, I'd really like to thank and comment on the extraordinary efforts of staff in 2020. Um, as I said, this has been a most unusual year and we had to adapt very, very quickly to some remarkable changes uh, in the way we delivered services, in the way we worked early in the year. And uh, the board had to consider things that wouldn't have been on our radar this time a year ago. And uh, the staff were remarkable in helping us respond uh, very seamlessly to the challenges that we were faced with early in the year with the COVID pandemic. Um, staff have kept working throughout the year to embrace these new challenges and find ways of working um, to build and strengthen partnerships and deliver impressive results across our region. And I really want to say this is testament to all of you, to the strength and resilience of the staff uh, to the extraordinary leadership from Mike and the executive team. And I really truly want to thank you on behalf of the board for all your extraordinary and continued efforts this year. Um, I also want to note and thank Sharon Sweeney, uh, no, sorry, that she's departed the organisation this year uh, to pursue other opportunities, but thank her for her work in leading the uh, primary care team and um, the legacy of her work is evident in the very high esteem in which this uh, team is held across the region and is now very ably led through uh, the, her successor in Anthony Elliott, who's continued to develop and support these relationships. I also want to acknowledge and thank all of our partners and the groups that we work with and our members across the region. These are extremely important um, relationships to us and it is uh, this shared commitment and working together in this region that will achieve better outcomes and a much stronger health system for us all. So uh, thank you to all our partners across the region. And finally, I want to th thank our three retiring directors today. Uh, Dr Ian Williams, firstly, who has had a very long and um, extraordinary role with the board of the PHN and its predecessor in the Medicare Local and its predecessors in the Divisions of General Practice. And uh, Ian has served on all of the subcommittees of the board, 
but most importantly, uh, he chaired the board for a number of years and uh, he transitioned us through the Medicare Local to PHN days. And um, I think uh, anyone associated with the PHN would join me in paying tribute to the extraordinary uh, efforts that Ian has made. So thank you, Ian, uh, for all of your efforts with the PHN. I also want to acknowledge uh, Joanne Jessup and Chris Townend, who are retiring at the end of their uh, three-year term. They've both been extraordinarily valuable members of the board. Jo uh, had chaired the Community Advisory Council and uh, took it to a, a whole new level of uh, commitment and opportunity and, and us hearing from valued community members. And I thank you, Jo, for your leadership of that group and also your participation on the nominations committee at one point. Uh, Chris has played a role on the Finance, Audit and Risk Committee and made a very significant contribution in that regard, uh, as well as served on the Nominations Committee and both directors have played vital ro roles at the board level too. So uh, thank you both for your very strong commitments during your three-year term. And I'd also like to acknowledge that Hamza Vayani uh, resigned from the board in July this year, but acknowledge his uh, role while on the board and his input and note that he also uh, served on the people, uh, Governance, People and Culture Committee of the Board. So uh, thanks for your service, leadership and commitment, uh, Ian, Joe, Chris and Hamza during your period. And um, my thanks in, con in conclusions to my fellow board members uh, for all the support you've provided me that, and that you've also provided to the organisation through, as I said at the beginning, what has been an extraordinarily challenging year. And a special thanks to our Deputy Chair who supports me on a daily basis, uh, Nino DeMarco. So um, that concludes a brief summary from myself and I'd now like to hand over to Mike Bosel, the CEO of the PHN, for his report. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which we are meeting here today and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. My thanks to the chair for her reflections on a very big year and my personal thanks to you and the board for your continued support and guidance. And just how big was this year? 2020 is a hard one for anyone to sum up succinctly and we are no exception. So we've taken the liberty of making a short animation which I'd like to share with you now for the first time. 2020 brought unprecedented challenges, strategic opportunities and one big surprise. And through everything, we have continued to support our communities and the primary health professionals who care for them to stay healthy, connected and well. We worked hard to strengthen and reform the health system in the Brisbane South region as part of our efforts to ensure no one falls through the gaps, accessing the services they need when and where they need them. We continue to strengthen our partnership with Metro South Health, launching a framework to guide ongoing collaboration for planning and delivery of integrated mental health, suicide prevention, alcohol and other drug services. We're working together to deliver efficient, effective and responsive services to meet the varying needs in our communities, putting people with a living experience, their carers and local communities at the centre of everything we do. We partnered with the Pacifica and Maori community, Metro South Health and Children's Health Queensland to develop a five-year plan for Pacifica and Maori health and wellbeing. We're working towards a collaborative, family-centred and culturally responsive approach to deliver better health futures for Pacifica and Maori peoples in our region. The horrific murder of a woman and her three children in our region in February highlighted the prevalence of domestic and family violence and the importance of our ongoing work to strengthen GPs' ability to identify and respond to people who need help. Our Recognise, Respond, Refer program supports general practices to more effectively respond to domestic and family violence. It was recognised by the Australian Government for its impact then scaled up as a nationwide pilot program in six locations. We also cared for our youngest and oldest community members. 
we successfully launched the Get Ready for Baby health literacy campaign and continued collaboration with health and community partners on the Thriving and On Track program that offers child development checks through early childhood education centres in Logan and Inala. As part of the National Aged Care Navigator Trials, we worked with community organisations to help almost 4,000 older people access government-supported aged care programs. These trials will inform future policy and shape how Australia provides aged care support. We're proud to support the region's primary care workforce to deliver high-quality, person-centred care. This year, we launched the Discover PHN online learning platform to complement our ongoing workforce development activities. We also supported general practices to register and engage with the Practice Incentive Program for Quality Improvement, with 92% uptake from eligible practices across the region. Our relationship with the region's primary care sector was further strengthened at the start of the year when the COVID-19 pandemic changed the world as we knew it. Time was of the essence as we mobilised to support primary health teams to work safely and effectively with the right personal protective equipment, information and technical support. Our education team pivoted overnight to online delivery and we led the rapid transition to telehealth supporting safe continuity of care at a time of immense challenge. We also coordinated the establishment of five GP-led community respiratory clinics in Brisbane South, offering free testing and care for community members with symptoms of COVID-19. Throughout COVID-19, we have worked closely with community stakeholders, including First Nations, multicultural communities and the aged care sector to ensure our most vulnerable populations were supported to stay connected, informed and healthy. This included delivering tailored support packages to 82 residential aged care facilities, helping them to prepare and respond quickly in the event of an outbreak. It wasn't quite the year we expected, but we've maintained momentum on our strategic initiatives introduced innovations that will endure well beyond the COVID-19 pandemic and supported our communities to stay healthy and well. Brisbane South PHN success is a testament to the collective efforts of everyone in our region and we thank you for helping us to make this most unusual of years a successful one despite the challenges. As I look back on the frankly remarkable achievements of the team I am so very proud to lead, I keep returning to our organisational values, which have also been driving our reform agenda in recent months. A high performance culture is built on universal values that drive success within and beyond the organisation, fostering a united, collaborative and agile workforce equipped to take on new challenges and to adapt to changing times. And I think you'll agree that 2020 has comprehensively proven the benefits of unity, collaboration and agility. For some time now, Brisbane South PHN has embraced courage as one of our core values. In a practical sense, this means the courage to do what matters most for our community. The courage to advocate for change and innovation. The courage to meaningfully measure impact and the courage to work in different ways. As we look to an uncertain future, we have been working intensively as a team to develop new and more integrated ways of working that support our ongoing effort to be an organisation that is truly recognised for partnering to lead system reform, delivering meaningful and measurable health impact. If we're serious about moving the dial on issues that matter, then courage must be at the core of everything we do. As always, we can't do that without our partners. Effective system reform is built on effective partnerships, and we remain committed to convening, listening to, and collaborating with our system partners and communities in a range of ways that reform the health system and leverage our respective strengths. My sincere thanks to our health system partners, member organisations, primary care workforce, and those community groups and organisations working at the interface of community and health. My thanks also to our clinical and community advisory council members who provide such a vital link to our stakeholders. We have recently refreshed our membership as part of our regular review. And once again, we have been overwhelmed by the quality and diversity of applicants who are willing to share their expertise and insight with us. Last, and by no means least, 
I want to thank all of our staff. As a not-for-profit entity, we are a relatively small team, but tasked with an immense responsibility and remit. You are all doing such a phenomenal job of delivering sustained results in a fluid environment and your commitment to equity, innovation and meaningful community engagement is apparent in everything you do. The board and I look forward to supporting you as we continue our journey towards better health for the region. I don't have a crystal ball, but it seems very likely that 2021 will bring new and deepen vulnerabilities and health challenges for those communities that we serve. Today you will hear about the increased challenges we are seeing in relation to domestic and family violence in the region. Meeting these and other challenges won't be easy, but I am confident that we are well placed to do so. So with no for further ado, we'll move to our focus presentations. The remainder of our session focuses on the topic of domestic and family violence. So really a content note is necessary. Our session on the human impact of domestic and family violence in particular includes descriptions of physical, emotional and sexual violence. We will restate this content warning before the segment commences. The full session will also be accessible on our website if viewers choose to watch specific components at a later time. It is now my very great honour to introduce the Honourable Anne Rustin, Senator for South Australia and the Minister for Families and Social Services, who will share her insights on the national context for this issue. Welcome, Senator. It's fantastic to join you today for the Brisbane South Primary Health Network Annual General Meeting, albeit virtually. 2020 has been an especially challenging year. Like the rest of Australia, you have endured and adapted to the coronavirus pandemic while continuing to support the primary health sector in the South Brisbane area. And I also acknowledge the support you provided to families, community workers and service providers in the aftermath of the horrific murders of Hannah Clark and her three beautiful children. Their deaths shocked and appalled the nation. Domestic and family violence is totally abhorrent. It's inexcusable. We know that every two minutes police are called to a domestic and family violence matter and every day 12 women are hospitalised. And behind these statistics are real women. They are mothers, daughters, sisters, friends and colleagues. Women who are working hard and striving to live their best lives, but whose supposed loved ones are denying them the opportunity that the rest of Australia takes for granted. While we are seeing increasing equality, it's hard to fathom that so many women do not feel safe and are forced to live in fear of manipulation, control and violence. Like you, we want women and children in Australia to live free from violence in safe communities. Your work developing and delivering the Recognise, Respond and Refer program is making a valuable contribution to achieving this vision. I commend your efforts to improve the health system response to domestic and family violence through the Recognise, Respond and Refer model trial. I'd also like to acknowledge Brisbane South's support and mentoring of other PHNs delivering domestic violence trial activities. In recognition of your success, the government has provided $1.5 million over three years for Brisbane South PHN to expand the model trial to include additional locations. The importance of equipping GPs with the skills and confidence to sensitively inquire and respond to domestic and family violence cannot be underestimated because we know that GPs are really the first line of response in domestic and family violence. We all know early intervention is crucial. I absolutely believe that through training and support to our primary healthcare professionals, services can meet the needs of women and their children experiencing violence in the first instance and often at early stages. Through the Recognise, Respond and Refer program, you are making a real difference to improving outcomes early on for people affected by family and domestic violence. This is a national priority of the fourth action plan of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children. The fourth action plan represents the largest ever Commonwealth investment in addressing violence against women, providing $340 million in funding over three years. This investment includes early intervention and support services, as well as primary prevention to address the underlying drivers of violence against women. Much has been achieved under the plan, but there is still more work to be done. 
In March, the Morrison government announced $150 million in funding to support Australia's experiencing domestic, family and sexual violence due to the fallout from the coronavirus pandemic. $130 million of this funding has been provided directly to state and territory governments to invest in specialist services. We absolutely know that states like Queensland know what their frontline services need most. That's why we've allowed them to assess their own COVID situation and enhance services who are seeing the effects of the pandemic. The remaining $20 million has been directed to boost the capacity of national programs like 1800 Respect, Men's Line Australia and the Men's Referral Service, services that tie in with the work you do with healthcare professionals and early intervention. The current 12-year national plan will end in 2022 and the government is now looking ahead to develop the plan's successor. We are listening to the evidence given to the current parliamentary inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence and firsthand to groups like yours and the experiences you are having. This, together with public consultation from early next year, will inform our work beyond 2022. I sincerely thank Brisbane South PHN for your important work towards making Australia a safer place for women and children now and into the future. And I look forward continuing to work with you on the next national plan to prevent violence against women and their children. Thank you for your insights and continued support for the people of our region, Senator. I now invite Terry Butler, the federal member for Griffith, to share her insights on the local context for this issue. Welcome, Terry. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. To Professor Cindy Shannon and the board, and to Mike Bosel and all the staff of the PHN, as well as to all the member organisations and their staff, GPs, allied health providers, support staff, thank you so much for all of the work you've done this year. It has been a strange and difficult year, so I want to say thank you for your work because you have been instrumental in keeping Southsiders safe, so thank you. I also want to thank you for your continued focus on family and domestic violence. Of course, the South Side and the whole nation was devastated earlier this year, when in one of our local suburbs in Camp Hill, Hannah Clark and her children were killed. It was a horrible event and it really rocked our community. So I'm pleased that the PHN has continued its focus on family and domestic violence. I came along to the launch of Recognise, Respond, Refer a few years ago when the PHN was first starting out with this important program. And I'm very pleased to see how successful it has been to date. I'm also really proud to be one of your local members, to know that you are now rolling this program out on a national level with five more PHNs joining in. So congratulations for your work on this important program and for your continued focus on family and domestic violence. Of course, it has been a big year, but I'm sure there's a lot more work to come in the coming months and years as well. So thank you for the work that you have done and thank you for the work that you're about to do. I wish you all, all the very best. Thank you for your insights, Terry. Your long-standing support and advocacy continues to make a big difference to the people of our region. My name is Lucille Chalmers. I'm the Deputy CEO at Brisbane South PHN. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Domestic and family violence has long been a priority for us and the added pressures and challenges brought by this pandemic have only increased our resolve. When COVID-19 hit, we knew that there was an increased risk for people in our region, something that police data has so far confirmed. Between July 2019 and August 2020, Queensland Police reported a 16.8% increase on the previous year in the number of reported breaches in domestic violence protection orders across Brisbane South District, and a 22.7% increase for the Logan District in the same period. Preliminary indications from September and October suggest that this trend will continue. Shortly, I will share an overview of our Recognise, Respond, Refer program, which aims to support frontline health workers to identify and support people experiencing domestic and family violence. But first, I want to introduce Beck Fulbrook-Brown, our lived experience advisor on domestic and family violence, to share her story with us and to share her insights on what difference a program like this can make. 
Mike has already flagged a content note around this presentation, but please be reminded that this story does include descriptions of physical, emotional and sexual violence. Beck's presentation is about 10 minutes long if you'd like to rejoin us after the segment. A recording will also be available on our website after the AGM. Welcome Beck. over to you now. Hi, my name is Beck, and I'm the Lived Experience Advisor for the Recognise Respond Refer Program at Brisbane South PHN, and this is my story. When I turned 18, I moved in with my boyfriend and things started out pretty good. It's actually quite hard to figure out exactly where things went wrong and where it turned from healthy to unhealthy. I guess if I think really hard, my self-esteem was slowly eroded over time and it was really gradual, which is very often the case with domestic violence. Um, these little behaviours crept in, like being possessive or, or controlling, but those things are easily explained as worry and care. If I went through all of the subtle signs that were indicators along the way of domestic and family violence, we would be here until the next AGM. So for today, I'll be focused on the physical and sexual abuse I suffered. Although it is important to note that it, domestic violence comes in so many forms, physical, financial, emotional, psychological, on and on. In my case, the physical abuse started one day when he was really agitated and I tried to help him and he pushed me backwards. I fell and, and hurt my back on some furniture and he immediately apologised. And I figured it wasn't that big of a deal. I didn't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, so I dismissed it. A few months later, he came home from study one day and he was in a really, really bad mood. Wanting to escape the worst of it, I suggested, nearing the door with my keys in my hand, I suggested that I go out and grab dinner, asking what he wanted. Well, that was enough to set him off. He flew into a rage, and next thing I knew, I was up against the wall with his hand tightly around my throat. He was demanding to know, why does he always have to choose what we have for dinner? Why can't I ever figure it out? Things were getting darker and darker, and as the, my vision started to fade to black, I just remember thinking, like, this is it, this is how my life is going to end because I asked someone what they wanted for dinner. I really hope that no one finds out. <sighs> Next thing I knew, I was on the floor gasping for air, hearing him shout at me to just get out, get out. So I got up with tears just streaming down my face, packing my things when he came in and demanded to know what the hell I was doing, told me not to be ridiculous and asked, and told me I wasn't going anywhere. I just ignored him and kept on packing and then he mockingly asked me, where are you even going to go? Which was a really good question because when I'd moved in, I was taking a gap year and he told me not to bother with working because there was plenty of time for that and to just enjoy my time. So without money, I had no way to move out. Without a job, I had no way to get money. Without any work experience, I had no way to get a job. So essentially I was trapped. I didn't want my family to know what I was going through because I still cared about him and I didn't want them to think he was a bad guy. And I didn't really want my friends to know and he didn't really approve of most of them and we'd started to grow apart so it felt like a weird time to reach back out. Having no one to tell, I decided that it was definitely time to get a job. I didn't care how many applications I had to send, how little I would get paid or how far I had to travel, I was determined that I would make it happen. And in the meantime, I just hoped that maybe if I stopped making him mad, things would get a little better. But spoiler alert, that's really how it goes. Eventually when I did get a job, to make matters worse, when I would be around my colleagues or with my family or the friends on the rare times I would see them, there was this familiar rhetoric of like when DFE would come up and people would say, these silly women, why don't they just leave? And there was this also kind of smugness there about like, I would never tolerate that behaviour, I'd never be in that situation, which as you can imagine felt like bleeding out by death of a thousand paper cuts. My shoulders became a little heavier and I was determined to never let anyone find out. I couldn't bear the shame on top of everything else I was dealing with. So you can imagine my horror when one day on the way to work, I was covering up some marks from the night before and looked up and saw my colleague walking my way on the train. Terrified, I was sitting there hoping she hadn't seen anything but wasn't so lucky. When she came over, she asked me what I was doing and when she saw the marks, she asked what they were from. I gave random excuses until finally she wasn't having a bar of it and she just asked tell me what's going on I eventually conceded very dismissively that oh, something happened the night before it's really not a big deal it's it's fine I remember her saying I was prepared for her judgment and the wave of shame to come my way but she empathetically responded with something to the effect of this isn't okay what you're going through is not your fault 
this is domestic violence and there's support out there for you. Not wanting to keep talking about this topic, I brushed it off and went about my day. But in the back of my mind, my brain just kept ticking over and all of these little behaviours that I had originally dismissed, it was like all these dots were connecting about this amounting to something that really could be domestic violence. Although I'd always assigned myself the shame of being one of these women I would so often hear about, I had never quite labelled my situation as domestic violence. So to hear that from someone else for the first time that day really changed things for me. A few weeks later, one night after another altercation, he left the house telling me that when he got back, he was going to kill me. And looking at the rage in his eyes that night, I knew I was going to die. Terrified, petrified, scared, it doesn't begin to tell you how I felt. My heart was in my throat. My thoughts were racing faster than I could keep up with. I was shivering, I was terrified, and I, I knew I had to leave, but I felt frozen stiff. I didn't know what to do, and the thoughts just getting, were getting faster and faster, and all I could hear resounding over and over was him saying, where are you even gonna go? Until I remembered my friend's voice, saying, this is domestic violence, support exists. I did what any millennial would do and I Googled it. And up came up a hotline number, which I called, and they were able to calmly explain to me what I needed to do and what needed to happen next. Everything from that point on is a blur, but all I know is that I wasn't there when he got home that night and I'm here today to tell you that. Having my friend help me recognise the situation I was in, responding with empathy and referring me to the fact that support was out there is what saved my life. You might think, well, can't people recognise the situation they're in themselves and respond by taking care to avoid such situations? Well, I tested it for you because I've tried many times to avoid this, but it's not as easy as you might think. After that first experience, you can imagine that dating felt like a minefield. I was hypervigilant, constantly on the lookout for the smallest red flag of controlling behaviour or any threat of danger really. I was absolutely paranoid and my brain just never stopped. Eventually I turned to alcohol to try and slow these thoughts and to numb the pain that I just couldn't face, which led to me being date raped one night. This, combined with my history of domestic and family violence, led to a downward spiral of severe anxiety, depression, complex PTSD. I was jumpy, I constantly felt unsafe, uh, my hair fell out from the stress, I gained 20 kilos, I struggled to fall asleep, I struggled to stay asleep. When I did fall asleep, I would have horrific nightmares and flashbacks. I had even more difficulty navigating healthy relationships than I did before. Over the years, I had a series of intense and turbulent relationships that had a wide range of different kinds of abuse. For those of you who might think it's as simple as leaving, I can tell you that it's not. When I did leave, I was stalked, I was threatened, I had ex-partners showing up at my house at random hours of the night, leaving death threat voicemails from private numbers. And I was so scared all the time that they would somehow know I was home that sometimes when I'd get home from work, I would walk in and sit in my closet because it was the only room that didn't have any windows and I would often fall asleep there. It was exhausting. After one relationship ending somewhat amicably, I felt like finally I was free from all of this. I worked really hard then to keep up those positive interactions to try and avoid the harassment of the past. One time, this ex-partner realised that I had repartnered, and that's when the freedom stopped. He had an unusually high-pitched voice, and through gritted teeth, he told me that he was really happy for me. And that night, he raped me in my bed. I don't have words to tell you how traumatising it is to never feel safe anywhere, ever, to this day. I still struggle to fall asleep and I still have nightmares and flashbacks on a nearly daily basis. I mean, I got rid of the bed and the mattress, moved house, but the psychological scars of that still remain. And I maintain that death would have been more merciful than what I suffered through that night. It was only recently, years later, that I was able to recognise that this too was a form of domestic violence. So no one is immune. 
this traumatic experience has happened to me despite my many, many privileges. And it can affect anyone of any gender, of any race, background, religion, occupation. No one is safe from this. I invite you to consider how much more difficult this is for members of the LGBTIQA plus communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and those with disabilities. I know this has been really heavy and you're probably feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now. Trust me, so am I. And you also might be starting to feel a little bit sorry for me, but please don't. I don't mean to sound ungrateful, but I don't want your thoughts or your prayers or your well wishes either, because truth be told, it changes nothing. And what we need now more than anything is change and action. So where do you come in? How can you make a difference? And how does this fit with primary care? Well, because things aren't as clear cut to the person in the situation as they are to an observer. Having an objective perspective from someone that you trust, who you know cares about your well-being, can be the difference between life and death. It literally is a lifeline. Domestic violence perpetrators often isolate their victims away from their family, friends, people that care about them. They also oftentimes have the victim survivor question their own reality, so it can be hard to know which way is up. To me, when I think of well-being and trust, primary care makes sense. And if I told you that one of the leading causes of death was heart disease, would you maybe be more mindful to screen your patients for this or be more attuned to look out for symptoms of that? I'm sure you would. It would only make sense to do so. So when I tell you the true fact that the leading preventable contributor of death and illness of Australian women aged 18 to 44 is intimate partner abuse, please have the same response. Please know that you absolutely have an opportunity to save lives. It's estimated that full-time Australian GPs are seeing up to five women per week who have suffered some form of intimate partner abuse, emotional, physical or sexual, in the past 12 months. And it's less clear how bad it is for men because men are so discouraged from speaking up about abuse that they've suffered through that it is significantly underreported. Does this mean that you're expected to solve all their problems, become a therapist for them, or even to become an expert in domestic violence? No. But just as you would with any other patient of yours with a major risk factor to their health, keep an eye out for symptoms. Ask more questions if something seems a bit off and refer on to a specialist if needed. Or neatly summarised uncoincidentally as recognise, respond, refer. I know you already have a difficult job and I'm not here to make it harder. I'm here to tell you that we have a team to support you, training exists, and we have a role that exists just to support GPs with making those referrals to the right place. We want you to succeed and we want to support you. I'm an illustration of what slipping through the cracks looks like. I would be dead right now if my friend took a different train to work that day or if she didn't ask me the questions in the way she did. I could go on and on with the what ifs. I'm going to tell you that again. I would not be sitting here today if my friend took a different train to work. That can't be the system that we rely on and that can't be our safety net. It's not been working. I know that this isn't a pleasant topic. So I understand the temptation to think, I'll check that out when I get a chance and throw it on the bottom of your ever growing to-do list. But please don't, please don't close out of the AGM today and resume your busy work day, checking your emails and brush this off as you get a cup of coffee. I, I know that there's a really high likelihood that you might not ever think about this call again or the things that I've said today, but for me, this is my inescapable reality, as it is for so many others. And we don't get the chance to just mentally brush this off as we resume our day. Nothing's going to get better by leaving things as they are. I've shared things with you today that some of my closest friends and family have 
never heard before. I have colleagues on the call that now know some of my darkest moments of my life and I've shared with you some of my most sensitive vulnerabilities. So believe me when I tell you that this has not been easy. I just hope it has been worth it and that's something only you can make happen. If you remember nothing else that I have said today, please remember this. You can save many lives by recognising, responding and referring and we're here to help you do that. This can't wait, so I hope that our team hears from you really soon. Thank you. Thank you, Beck, for your strength and conviction in sharing your experiences and insights with us. We're so very glad to have you with us as we work to understand and respond to the needs of people experiencing domestic and family violence. A few years ago, we embarked on an evidence-based, human-centred design process with the Australian Centre for Social Innovation and other partners to develop an integrated and localised health response to domestic and family violence. The Recognise, Respond, Refer program aims to support primary healthcare professionals to improve overall system responsiveness to people experiencing domestic and family violence. We've developed a short sketch video that explains how it works. In Australia, on average, one woman a week is murdered by her current or former partner. Almost 10 women a day are hospitalised for assault injuries perpetrated by a spouse or domestic partner. To tackle domestic and family violence, we all need to work together. Brisbane South PHN is working collaboratively with general practice and the domestic and family violence sector to implement an initiative to confront this problem. Recognise, respond, refer. Three very important words. Three ideas that can save a life. It's never been more important. The Recognise, Respond, Refer program supports general practices to do just that to recognise the signs of domestic violence, to respond supportively, and to provide referrals that can open a pathway to safety. There are six areas of activity in the program. These work together to support general practices to become part of an integrated, system-wide response to domestic and family violence. The Domestic and Family Violence Local Link is key to it all. The domestic and family violence system can be complex to navigate at times. DFE local link workers are trained specialists that can help carry this load for general practice by being a single point of referral for local support. The DFV local link can also build the confidence and capability of the general practice team through workforce capacity building opportunities. This can be through day-to-day -day interactions and by connecting them with RACGP accredited training. A whole of practice response is critical. The DFV local link is there to support every member of the general practice team to play their role. By implementing practice-wide measures that create a safe space for disclosure, enable meaningful referrals and ongoing medical support, general practice staff can change lives for the better. But general practices are just one part of the solution. DFV local links support general practices to integrate into their local domestic and family violence system and become part of something bigger, a united, place-based response. We know that sometimes the work on a local level can become stuck. Bigger system-level issues can block the way. The Recognise, Respond, Refer program works to bring together the right people from across the system to shift these issues and clear the path for those working on the ground. To achieve all this, the program must keep evolving and improving. Measures to continually evaluate, design and iterate are built into all areas so data and stories can be collected and used in regular learning cycles. This ensures that people affected by domestic and family violence can receive the right support in the right place at the right time. Recognise, respond, refer. Find out more by visiting bsphn.org.au. As you can see, the Domestic and Family Violence Local Link Service 
is a key part of the Recognise, Respond, Refer program. These specialists act as a single point of referral, facilitating integration between general practices and the local domestic and family violence services. We'd like to introduce you to our domestic and family violence local link team. My name is Joanna Cleavy Longman. I'm the education and engagement worker at the Brisbane Domestic Violence Service for the Brisbane South region. Hi, my name is Summer O'Brien. I'm the Brisbane South local link worker for the Brisbane South region. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Atwell Moore. I am the DB local link from the Brisbane Domestic Violence Service covering the Brisbane South region. Hi, I'm Michaela. Um, I am the Logan Domestic and Family Violence local link um, and I work for the Centre for Women and Co in Logan. Hi, my name's Grace. I'm the Domestic and Family Violence local link um, for the Redlands region and work for the Centre for Women and Co. Hi, I'm Linda James. I'm the Domestic and Family Violence Local Link team leader and trainer for the Redlands, Logan, Bow Desert and Scenic Rim region. Thanks to all our Domestic and Family Violence Local Links. We're very positive about the potential of this program, which has already shown great results. Earlier this year, we were proud to have the Australian Government recognise the program for its impact and fund its expansion to a national trial in six locations. Further development work is underway to ensure the program can support primary care to best respond to domestic and family violence in the context of people's specific culture, identity and experiences. This development work also includes ensuring the program supports primary care to safely and effectively work with perpetrators of domestic and family violence. We encourage all general practices in the region to join us in rolling out this initiative. I now welcome the insights of Dr. Deepa Balakrishnan, who is working in a practice that has embraced the Triple R program. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deepa. I'm one of the GPs on the Bayside. I came to know about the DFV Local Link a few months ago when Grace came in to introduce herself to the practice. On the same day, I had a patient come in in tears. This is a young lady who I have known for years. She for the first time told me that she was not feeling safe at home. I called Grace. She came in straight away, spent almost an hour with the patient, gave her advice, support plans and uh, linked her into other services. Since then I have seen other patients with issues linked them with the service and they have all been taken care of. I feel that knowing that DFP Local Link exists helps me feel that the patients who are at risk or who need urgent help can be assisted straight away. They feel supported. As a practice, we feel supported as well. Recently, Sharon asked me whether having DF, DFP Local Link has help me recognize more patients at risk? I said no at the time. But have I been able to help more people? Yes, I have been. I would ask you all, if you haven't done so already, to do the recognize, respond, refer to the domestic violence training so that you feel confident in identifying patients and feel more comfortable in talking to a vulnerable per person. Knowing what to say to them is important as well. They need to feel supported. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balakrishnan. Clinicians and general practice staff are integral to our efforts to address and mitigate the impacts of domestic and family violence in the region. Your leadership and care will be making a huge difference to your patients in times of need. We truly value your commitment to this program. Also, thank you to Beck for having the courage to share your remarkable journey with us and uh, we truly appreciate your honesty and courage. I now invite our speakers to join me in answering any questions that have been made about the program or, or work more broadly over the past year. A reminder, if you have any, to use the box in the screen next to this to uh, field your questions. I do have a couple, so I'll start um, with one to you, Lucille, um, from Lynn Blyton. 
How are you planning to measure when women are stopped from connecting with their doctors as this could be an unwanted ramification of the program? Thanks for your question, Cindy and, and Lynn. There's no doubt this work is incredibly complex um, and fraught with difficulty in ensuring that we don't create a situation that is in fact worse for women. Um, a number of ways that we are looking to address that and a key strategy is to ensure that any of the design work is done in lockstep with women with lived experience. So we actually discuss these very issues with the women who are wanting to, to be using the services to ensure that that's something that doesn't happen. We're also conscious that we are wanting to encourage women to, to come to general practice and to create a safe space in general practice uh, to, address, uh, to address these issues. Uh, and we're conscious that when we talk about the program, we do so in a fairly targeted way. So we're targeting general practice in our promotion. We're not targeting the general community. Uh, thank you, Lucille. Um, Beck, I, I also have a couple of questions that came in before the meeting. So um, I'd like to direct one at you. Thanks again for sharing your story. Um, what's the one piece of advice you'd give a GP looking at this program? to engage. Uh, so we could design the most perfect program in the world, have it rolled out seamlessly, but if the people who it's targeted for are not engaged with the program, it's always going to fail. Um, so I would ask you to please engage if you have questions about the program, if you would still like more information, please engage with us. If you have a barrier to participating in this or you have you see something that doesn't sit right with you, uh, let us know. We are always looking to make this an improved um, program, but I can guarantee any doctor or primary care professional that's listening to this that they do have patients that are experiencing domestic violence, so it's better that they're equipped to, to support their patients in their holistic health in all aspects. Thank you. Um, I have another one for you, Lucille. Mm -hmm. um, with the program now being piloted across the country, what might be the next steps? Where might this go? Yeah, well, we're certainly very pleased to see the, the recognition from the Department of Health at the federal level to see that there are other trials uh, and the opportunity to gain learnings from all of those that are slightly different and, and delivered in different places is really exciting. Um, and hopefully the opportunity to expand even beyond the trials is, is something we'll be looking for. Uh, what we are also looking at um, more locally, I guess, in Queensland is that opportunity to really link in with the state health services uh, and the, the system more broadly within the state. We think there's a great opportunity for us to do that work collaboratively to ensure that um, the, the local systems around the, the hospitals and the um, outpatient health services, that all of those are connected, well connected with primary care in this work. Thanks, Lucille. And uh, I think we've got time for one more question, which uh, will be a non-recognised respect refer question, potentially. Um, and that, that's for you, Mike. Um, as CEO, other than COVID-19, what's been one of the biggest challenges for you as CEO in 2020? And COVID was a huge sort of draw for, for not only my PHN, but other PHNs as well. As well. I think Probably the main challenge we've got at the moment uh, through this year and, and going into next is as a government initiative, we are subject to the vagaries of, of government funding. And that particular backdrop is further complicated by what we're seeing in terms of the Productivity Commission into Mental Health, the handing out of the Royal Commission into Aged Care early next year. So these all add to a high degree of uncertainty as to how and where we'll be working. And that really doesn't help our work with uh, our partners, people that we work through our commission programs, which we try and achieve a kind of stability. And that stability means that we have to work in advance of the particular environment we're faced with now. And we have to plan for the next, you know, not only 12, 18 months, but the next two years. And that, that funding vagary doesn't help that. Thank you, Mike. I've had a couple more questions come in in the meantime. So um, I I think this one is probably for you, Lucille. Mm -hmm. uh, what is BSPHN doing to ensure the organisations we refer to are providing a high level of practice? So, the in, in, in terms of 
this particular work around domestic and family violence, we've been out to market and we've sought service providers that um, we know are very skilled in this work. So we go through several quality checks uh, and we work very closely with the organisations to ensure that that's the case. Um, more broadly, that's a system that we follow um, in general with the work, that we, we go through a competitive process, we assess organisations' capabilities, and then we work alongside those organisations to together design the services that are needed, um, that respond to the voice of the consumer that we've, we've spent time um, uh, working with, so we understand what services are needed, uh, and then we approach it as a partnership between the PHN and the service providers and the person with lived experience. And we think that's the best way that we can get quality services. Thanks, Lucille. Um, and I think you may want to start with this one, Beck, and if anybody else wants to add, um, we're being asked what work is being done to engage called communities? What a great question. <laughs> So uh, I'm actually, as our lived experience advisor, working with our program team to engage with uh, people from different communities around the, their lived experience. Uh, so we've engaged Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, people from the LGBTIQ background, um, those with disabilities, and we are working with uh, women and uh, people with, from culturally and linguistically diverse communities uh, to understand how we could take this program and then make sure it is inclusive and tailored more towards these areas um, and following that we'll do more work to see how that can be integrated with the existing model of the program, what adjustments need to be made, but we are certainly taking into consideration that we need to be inclusive of, of all people in our community we serve. Great to hear, thank you. Um, I think that probably concludes the questions and right on time almost, so um, at that point I think I'll draw the meeting to a close. I'd like to thank all our speakers and participants in this virtual AGM. Um, thank the board again for your ongoing support and commitment this year. I uh, thank our member organisations and the audience. Can I remind you that this AGM recording will remain on our website if others uh, want to watch it or re-watch it. Um, but again, uh, thanks to the team. Mike's just talked about what a challenging year it's been. Um, and I really want to once more add my thanks to the staff, thanks to the board, thank you very much to our retiring directors and a very warm welcome to our new directors and uh, that concludes our 2020 AGM. Thank you very much.